Okay, hello and welcome to our presentation. On behalf of the whole presentation team, we're all really excited to be giving this final proposal. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank Dave, Ethan, Oxana, and the rest of the TAs for work working with us very closely throughout the whole term on the project. And I'd like to thank Sandra and Brad for taking the time the other day to kind of be here with us today. So this proposed facility is a huge investment for Prescott because it can provide social and economic growth, but it's also a huge investment for Ontario. So in this presentation, we'll be giving you a bit of an economic analysis and breakdown on how we can increase the profitability as well as do cost reductions on the actual plant. We'll be talking a bit about the social benefits of the plant, and then we'll also be talking about um, while we, not be, bleh, while we m might not be moving forward with the plant, we'll be proposing a pilot plant in order to reevaluate the economics. So, first and the most important thing is we want to understand the goal and why we're doing this project in the first place. So, we want to take this, which is our fast-growing poplar, and somehow turn it into this, which is our natural gas. And how do we do that? So, to a lot of people, people think it's some type of magic, but uh, to us and, uh, you know, everyone in this room, it's essentially chemical engineering. <clears throat> So we know what we want, right? We know we want uh, natural gas, but uh, there's a lot of factors that tie into this whole project and how we're gonna get there. So there's the money, there's our profits, and over the course of the term, we've looked at our cost analysis. There's the people, people like you and me, the communities, people at Prescott, the operators, the construction workers who are all gonna be involved in this project. There's the environment, the most important thing. And then there's the safety, because we all, all want to go home safe and sound and go back to our families. And with all these factors, we can build a green facility and uh, we can work towards making this a very uh, profitable project. So a little bit about the project itself, like what Adam said, it would be located in Prescott, Ontario. The natural gas will tie into the Trans-Canada Pipeline. And what we evaluated over the course of this term and what we'll be letting you know about throughout this presentation is the evaluation of where we're going to be selling our gas to and uh, the cost-benefit analysis, analysis of that. All right, so the overall objective of our work for this term was to develop a feed package or a front-end engineering design pro uh, uh, package. And so that has all the engineering documentation, calculations, and so on. But we also wanted to make sure that we hit all of the main overarching objectives. So I'm going to talk a bit about that right now. And so the first one are business objectives. And so we wanted to maximize the profitability of the operation while also identifying the risks of entering the energy business and the risks of operation. Second are environmental objectives. So we wanted to minimize our carbon footprint and also reduce <laughs> our emissions. And along with that, we wanted to try and convert any of the waste that we would be producing into any products that we could sell. And finally, our technical objectives. So as Seymour said before, we're going to be sending it to the Trans-Canada Pipeline. So we have to make sure that we meet all their specifications while also taking into account proper engineering governance, standards, and codes. And above all, we wanted to make sure that the plant is safe and that it works. All right, so the motivations behind putting this natural gas plant in Prescott are the environmental benefits and the social benefits. So the environmental benefits of this plant are that the natural gas that is produced is a lot greener than conventionally produced natural gas. This is because the trees that are consumed in the process grow back, and as they grow, they absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Also, this plant eliminates the need for drill sites, which prevents any risks from chemical spills from drilling equipment or erosion due to the drill site itself. And finally, we're also producing green electricity from this process, which is not produced using fossil fuels. This takes the place of electricity on the grid that is produced using fossil fuels, and so will overall shrink the carbon footprint of eastern Ontario. And as for the social benefits, it mainly boils down to jobs and money for Prescott. So this plant would uh, provide a lot of jobs for the community, from blue-collar positions such as construction workers and operators, all the way up to more white-collar jobs like administrative assistants, engineers, and business people. And the plant would actually invest in these workers with a $1,130,000 annual payout to its employees. Also, every year, it would pay $19,350,000 in terms of insurance, taxes, and overhead, a lot of which would go, a lot of which would go back into the Prescott community in terms of property taxes, things like that. 
And in addition to all of these jobs and, and money that's flowing back into Prescott, you would also have a lot of encouragement for investment in the Prescott area from other green companies. Because if this process works, it's going to be a very positive image for the town of Prescott. It would make it a green leader in Canada. And so it would encourage businesses from across Canada to pour money into Prescott and to further create more jobs. So this isn't necessarily a new process that we have going on here, or a new idea. Bioenergy has been around for a while. And we can see that in things like the renewable energy approvals that we have to, well, we have to have one as well. But the renewable energy approvals that we have to get from the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, there are currently 199 projects in the process of being approved in Ontario alone right now. Uh, 14 of those are bioenergy, and 11 of those have already been approved. So this isn't necessarily something that is outside of the scope of something that's feasible. But what's different about ours is we're not using corn like most other people. So uh, corn is something that is commonly used because you can extract ethanol from it. You can break down the starch into simple sugars. And right now, actually, ethanol is, well, it started in 2000 as 1% of the market shares of gasoline in the United States. It moved to 3% in 2006, and then it got up to 10% in 2011. So that's definitely a growing business there. But one of the issues with corn is that it can only be grown in certain locations. So while there's lots of benefits with the fact that the byproducts are all environmentally friendly as well, a lot of it is being used to feed uh, farmyard animals. You can use it in the cars. There's usually about an 85-15 split um, in the fuel that's being used, but it's only being found around uh, the corn belt. And that's because corn, it only, if this changes. Yeah, so corn, it only really grows in certain areas. So in Canada, it grows in Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec. So that leaves out a lot of Canada. And when the snow comes, it means that the crops all disappear. That's because they're an annual crop. There's a lot of crop, um, a lot of harvesting, a lot of work has to go in at one point, and then it's gone. So it takes away a little bit of the continuity of the project. So what we were thinking is instead, let's use a biomass source that uh, can be year-round. So we're suggesting poplar trees. And now, really, the key that we're looking for here is how we can get uh, the gas out of these poplar trees, similar to how we would for ethanol. All right, so gasification is the method that we've been looking at in terms of getting our gases out of the system. Um, there are two main types of gasification processes that have been around and been developed more thoroughly in terms of industry, partial oxidation gasification and hydrogasification. Now, um, gasification turns this into syngas by superheating it above 700 degrees Celsius. And this takes out all the com volatile components in the wood, such as hydrogen, nitrogen, um, H2S, CO and CO2, and the desired gas, methane, which is what we want to burn. Now, hydrogasification was chosen because when you add hydrogen to the system, it promotes the production of methane, so you get more methane out of the system. Also, when you um, use hydrogasification, you don't have to blow air into the system, which reduces utility costs, and you can run the process wet, meaning you don't have to dry the wood before actually putting it into the gasifier, which is another reduction in utilities. Um, also, because it's wet, you can add steam into it, which improves the production of the gases in the, in the system. And you can also have alternative modes of transportation, such as a pipeline. Okay, so the next main thing we looked at was the <laughs> methanation process, which is how we make our methane, pretty much. So essentially what it is, is the thin gas that comes out of the gasifier gets converted through reactions to a methane-rich stream, and then that stream can then be further processed downstream. But there are two main there are two main reactions that are occurring simultaneously within the reactor. They're the water gas shift reaction and the reverse steam methanation reaction. Uh, they're both reversible, and from the kinetics, when they're run at relatively low temperatures, um, you can see that it'll actually work out how we have it here. So the kinetics and equilibrium is really push in our favor. So the carbon monoxide from the syngas and the water, it'll actually form and make um, carbon dioxide as well as hydrogen. Now the carbon dioxide buildup uh, gets dealt with in our CO2 treatment, but that hydrogen is used in the reverse steam methanation reaction, which you can see here. So we're using the reverse steam. So we got we're going to have this carbon monoxide again, and then 
the hydrogen from our water gas ship as long with, along with the residual hydrogen that's just in the syngas itself. From there, it gets pushed and you end up with your, your methane. And then from there, it's just a matter of processing, purifying, and getting it getting up to product specs. All right, so absorption is one of the ways that we use to kind of clean our product. So absorption is, there's two types of absorption. There's chemical and then there's uh, physical absorption. Chemical absorption is where you have like a chemical reaction occurring with the gases that you don't want and the absorb, ab absorbent. And physical absorption is where you have the unwanted chemicals going into the absorbent. So it's basically like a solvent which takes up the unwanted chemicals. So why do we need to do this? We might want to do this to purify our product, to make it more pure, and we might want to do it to remove any unnecessary components or toxic components like hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide can, talk, it can poison our catalyst, which is obviously something that we don't want to do, so we want to get rid of it. Um, distillation is another type of separation that we use, and distillation is basically just the separation of components based on relative volatilities. There's two main types of distillation as well. There's simple distillation, which occurs in one basic step, so it just brings out the, the volatile substance, and fractional distillation occurs in many different steps. And that's usually achieved by having something in the distillation column in which the volatile component can condense onto, and then it falls down the column and is constantly being boiled back up again. So fractional distillation is generally more efficient than, or not more efficient, but more better at separating the components than simple distillation. So we generally use that, and that's used by putting like some kind of material into the column which you can condense stuff down onto. So we're going to tell you about the process we designed to take this poplar and turn it into methane in a way that's better for the environment than anything that's ever done before. So this is a PSD of our process and its main steps. First, we have gasification, followed by water removal and hydrogen sulfide removal. Then there's recycling of the hydrogen back to the gasifier. There's the methanation reaction, removal of more water and carbon dioxide, final gas preparation, and then regeneration of the amine. So first is the gas fire, which takes in the poplar in the form of wood chips and spits out thin gas. The thin gas is composed of hydrogen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, water, and methane. The thin gas then goes to a water knockout drum where water is removed at the bottom, and we, we're left with sour gas. Sour gas has hydrogen sulfide in it, which we don't want, so it goes through an absorber that uses DGA amine to remove the hydrogen sulfide, and sweet gas comes out of that absorber. Now going back to the gasifier, we're using a hydro gasifier, meaning we need hydrogen for it. But buying hydrogen can cause the price to skyrocket, and it can be dangerous to keep hydrogen on site. So we're taking it from another source in the process. We're taking off some of the sour gas that comes out of the first knockout drum, compressing it, putting it through pressure swing absorption, and then we'll be left with pure hydrogen that we can recycle back to the gasifier. Then we're moving on to the methanation reactor, which is our money maker. We feed CO2 and hydrogen gas to produce methane that we're going to brew with salt. We also pack the reactor with a catalyst that provides us a 70% conversion of CO2 into methane. To, make, to meet the specifications of the sales gas, it's very important to ensure that there is no water in the system. First step to dehydrate is a knockout drum that reduces the content of water in the gas. Uh, then the gas moves on to the second absorber, which uh, absorbs all the CO2 and passes the DGA amine back to the stripper to ensure that it regenerates and we can reuse it further. Uh, methane, CO2, and uh, water then goes to the dehydration skin, where we reduce the content of water even further. Uh, then we pressurize the gas before injecting into the pipeline. Uh, to achieve 63 bar pressure and 50 degrees Celsius. Now, what do we do with the amine that comes out of our two absorbers from the bottom? Amine is expensive, and to buy it without recycling it would cost us millions of dollars every year. So if we recycle it, it would only cost us a couple thousand dollars every year to replace the lost amine in the system. Now, when designing the amine recycle system, a purge system is used to add or remove excess DGA in the system, and a pump is used to recirculate the amine in the system. 
When designing the stripper column, many factors were considered, including the amount of CO2 that comes out of the bottom of the stripper, the amount of amine that goes into our system, the feed tray location, and the number of trays in our system. And as can be seen on this graph, an optimal point was located and used in our design. So there's three main priorities in designing PNIDs. They're safety, efficiency, and product quality. Quality of the product is ensured by designing ways to control and monitor the temperature and pressure in the process. Safety is ensured by designing alarms and shutdown methods as well as communication and monitoring methods. And efficiency is created by integrating energy use throughout the process. Here's what a PNID looks like after a few iterations. All right, process safety. Uh, the first step in process safety is hazard identification. To properly complete this, pro this process, the team first took a step back and evaluated the system as a whole. Next, all operating conditions, for example, pressure, temperature, rate of throat, flow through equipment, uh, were uh, noted by the team as well as any potential material hazards. Next, uh, the team stepped through each piece of equipment and process line <clears throat> for any potential sources of hazards. From this analysis, the team deduced that each of these hazards could be placed in one of three hazard consequence categories. Explosion, fire, or toxic release of chemicals. Yeah. So after the hazards have been identified, as Thea just mentioned, the three, the three hazards identified, we move on to hazard evaluation. So the team decided to do a what-if method to evaluate the hazard, which is a top-down approach. This means that you start with the hazard and you dig into the roots of the hazard, looking at the consequences and the mechanisms. So the first step of a what-if analysis is the mechanism. So you look at all the possible sources or failures in the process that could cause this hazard to occur. Next step is to list off all the consequences that might happen. So for instance, if it's a fire, it could be damage to equipment, could be harm to the operator. The next step is to list all the lines of defense that are existing in the process for this hazard. So that just involves going through the PNIDs and looking at the existing mechanisms to, to mitigate the hazard. Um, based off these three um, factors, you generate a risk number. So the risk number is based off severity uh, and the frequency or likelihood of the, of the hazard occurring. If the number, is, the number is between one and three, so if it's two or three, the team deems the hazard to be too dangerous and they suggest mitigation techniques to bring the number down to one. Um, if the number is one, then the team can move on to the next hazard, and this was done for every single hazard that the team was able to identify in the process. Right. So, risk management, protecting the yacht club. So as you can see from the uh, photo up there, uh, the very first site for the location for the plant uh, was proposed to be right in the middle of Prescott, um, and we had some lovely rural neighborhoods right next door, and across the way we had a marina as well. So, of course, when you're looking at risk management, you can't just manage the risk within the plant, but you actually have to consider the public safety then as a result. So then, as Rishi kind of touched on, what risks can we accept and what risks do we need to mitigate? So the team looked through all the different hazards and assessed the frequency and the severity of those hazards, and as Rishi said, applied a risk number. The uh, highest risk activities that, for example, could flatten the boat yard uh, had to be mitigated, whereas those that had low-cost impacts were deemed to be acceptable. Um, a few examples of the most high risk, uh, the highest risk hazards within the plant uh, would be explosion of the reactor due to a cooling water failure or the release of a toxic material uh, due to a vessel overpressurization. Um, a, a risk that would be uh, deemed to be acceptable, for example, would be the spilling of cooling water out onto the ground due to a pipe rupture. So following the risk assessment, the goal was to come up with a list of recommendations that would add layers of protection to the process, kind of like the layers of an onion. So this includes um, operational recommendations, such as having um, maintenance checkups, um, appropriate training, and as well as uh, implementing lockout procedures. Um, as well as we have a list for um, damage mitigation recommendations, um, for example, having an emergency evacuation procedure for uh, either fires, toxic releases, or explosions. Uh, the team also came up with a list of recommendations for process design and control. This would simply include having various control loops and indicators for pressure, temperature, and liquid levels. 
And then finally, for inherent safety recommendations, the team suggested using safer material and construction, and as well as having equipment that is fire retardant. Another recommendation was to move the location of the plant closer to the TransCanada pipeline. Uh, in doing so, this will not only reduce the risks associated with the town of Prescott, but will also reduce the capital costs relating to the infrastructure. Okay, so overall it was determined that the capital cost of the project is around $296 million. Uh, this includes direct costs such as the equipment costs, and uh, civil work, as well as indirect costs and contingency fees. So if we look at this diagram over here, we see that most of the capital is tied up to the gas fire as well as the PSA skid. And although we believe that we were able to accurately determine the cost of the gas fire using numerous historical data and inflating it to these values, one of our recommendations is to uh, get a vendor quote and uh, instead of using the capacity rate of factor method. So the other uh, thing we want to see for the operating costs is that the uh, yearly operating expenditure is about $183 million each year. Now, if we also look at this uh, graph over here, we see that uh, the raw material cost actually makes up for about approximately 40% of that. And this includes uh, the poplar as well as the hydrogen for startup. And of that 40%, 70% is associated with the poplar transportation and grower fees. Uh, another large portion of the operating cost is, of course, the utilities cost, and we were able to analyze that two-thirds of it has to do with the low-pressure steam for the reboiler and electricity for the gasifier. And in order to uh, reduce the operating cost or the utilities cost for the low-pressure steam, one of the things that we looked into was uh, using the steam that is generated from the heat integration system for the reboiler, uh, but it was determined that uh, creating electricity with this uh, low-pressure steam, it's more profitable for the project. And the other section we also want to look at is, of course, the, uh, the other section, which includes the direct uh, or the fixed manufacturing costs and general manufacturing expenses. So overall, there are two main uh, revenue streams for the project. The first, of course, being the produced gas, and the second being the electricity. And in total, the revenue is about $102 million each year. And finally, we looked into the best and worst case scenarios, and this was done by uh, sort of manipulating or looking into uh, the realistic variations in variables such as the, the exchange rates, the natural gas price, and the raw material feed costs based on 10-year historical highs and lows. And even for the best case scenario where we kind of underestimated the equipment costs to use the 10-year historical high uh, natural gas price and 10-year historical low uh, raw material feed cost, we determined that the probability of the net present value being greater than zero was just around 7%. Okay, so in order to generate a revenue and calculate our cash flow, we had to first establish price of natural gas in Ontario. So looking at this graph, you can see a black line that represents the historical market price of natural gas. Right now, it's at around 13 cents per meter cubed, and it's been steadily decreasing since 06. So since we're environmentally green in our operation, we're looking to, or our plan is to add a premium to this price. So our price is going to be at around 26 cents based on the additional premium that we're adding. So when we were doing our financial model, we also found out that the break-even price for selling our natural gas was around 74 cents per meter cubed. So in order to, so we need a market price of natural gas to be around 61 cents because of our premium. However, we haven't seen prices in the market for natural gas like this since before 2006. So instead of waiting for the price of natural gas to rise or for the dollar to strengthen in our favor, we came up with a few recommendations. So upon doing our sensitivity analysis, we found that sales gas revenue, capital costs, and feedstock costs were the most significant contributing factors to our net present value. So first, looking at our sales revenue, one of our recommendations is to obtain contracts with our clients. This contract would hold the selling price of our natural gas constant regardless of what the market price is. This may grant us the opportunity to obtain a potentially positive cash flow and reduce and, and uh, gain additional revenue. Taking a look at our capital costs, uh, one of the factors we used was contingency, and that was placed at 20% of the total plant costs. 
This resulted in an additional $60 million, and changing this percent by even one will result in a few millions of savings. So what we recommend is, or since contingency is such a large portion of the additional costs, this is one of many factor estimates that we've used in our cost analysis. So due to our experience, we recommend more detailed and rigorous engineering to come up with more accurate cost estimates, and this may prove to reduce our capital costs and put us in the green. Great. So a couple slides ago, we showed you that 40% of our operating costs come from raw materials. And of that 40%, 70% is allocated to trucking our wood feedstock. So to put that in perspective, if we built this plant today, we would be spending $50 million a year just on getting wood to the plant. That's roughly half our revenue. So we looked at this cost and saw that as a major opportunity for cost savings. So the University of Alberta recently did a study that looked at the economics of different modes of transportation for wood chips. And what they concluded was that for large-scale operations such as our own, it is most economic to transport those wood chips by pipeline. So this prompted us to do our own investigation of a wood slurry pipeline as an alternative form of transportation. So to get the wood to the plant, we assumed that you would need a slurry that was 50% water by volume. We also said you would need two pipelines. So one pipeline would transport the wood slurry to the plant, and the other pipeline would recycle the water back to the inlet so it could be remixed with the incoming wood chips. To determine our operating and capital costs, we sized three sets of pumps and storage tanks and determined the required pipeline sizes. And then lastly, we assumed that we would still incur 25% of those original trucking costs since the inlet would be in the center of the harvest area. So, even after adding a 30% contingency to our estimate, we found that implementing this alternate form of transportation would still increase the overall project NPV by $140 million. Now, on top of reducing our operating costs by 60%, a pipeline would have many other non-monetary benefits. So pipelines are generally much safer modes of transportation, they have lower carbon emissions, and they would reduce the traffic congestion that would otherwise occur. So overall, if this project were to be implemented, we highly recommend that this alternative form of transportation be used to bring our wood feed stock to the plant. Now, despite the decrease in operating costs, unfortunately, the current project economics are still uh, not feasible as the project has negative cash flow and does not have a positive MPV. This is a flow chart showing the overall design process that we have for this project. So you start with an idea and a conceptual design, you move into a feed package, and then you can move into actually uh, doing the detail engineering and construction of the project. So where are we right now? We're at the point where we've completed our feed package and we should have obtained enough information to make an informed decision as to whether or not we can carry this project towards the, de the detailed design and actual construction. But what does this feed tell us? Well, first of all, our plant works, but it costs almost $300 million to construct. <laughs> And that is a lot of money. Um, this is our direct field cost, and it is in Canadian dollars, but that is a lot of money that we're going to have to build. Um, the next thing we, uh, we know is that we can produce almost a million cubes per day of methane from just 2,000 tons per day of wood, which is, is, which is quite a bit. We can produce a lot of methane which is with this plant and can really um, build a positive influence for Presto. Unfortunately, one of the larger takeaways from our, NP, or from, our, from our fee package here is that we have not come up yet with favorable economics. Um, the net present value is very, very negative at the moment, and that doesn't necessarily bode too, too well. However, there are some, there, it's not necessarily dead in the water. There's, there's some good news too. Um, firstly, this MPV that we calculated is based on really, really aggressive safety factors that you know, if the project was to be tested in a more rigorous way, it could maybe be cut down. We could maybe figure out a more accurate, um, an accurate assessment of how much this is really going to cost us. Um, bigger government grants are coming down the pipeline. Um, another big part of our problem with our economics right now is that they hinge on several external factors like the Canadian dollar, and, um, and, and those things could swing quite in a different direction in the future. Um, and lastly, I mean, it's, it would be a great thing for Prescott if they were to have an industry of this size in the town. Um, so what are we going to recommend? One of the recommendations we have is to potentially still build a pilot plant. We think that with various government funding, this could be done 
not that expensively, and it might be. We think that it could reduce a large amount of the uncertainty in the current economics that we've we've calculated, and it would really prove the green technology that we're we've been investigating over the course of this uh, the course of the semester. Right. The next thing we would have to look at is sources of federal funding. Uh, project right now would be very hard to secure funding through <laughs> conventional methods, but the new Liberal government has promised up to $4 billion for green energy projects. And if you really look at the profile of Prescott as a town, it kind of fits the profile perfectly. It's, you know, in need of economic revitalization. It's got people who want the project, and it also has a green popular resource right there. So it would be a perfect fit, and we think you should at least you know, investigate getting some government funding from, from the new Liberal government. Uh, another recommendation? Press the side button. Okay. Um, so yeah, looking looking at what Lucas mentioned about the project kind of hinging on factors that are out of our control. The project has a good idea, and with a lot of work, maybe a new pilot plant, reduced uncertainty, you could still find some promise to it. Thing is, you're going to have to wait on several things like the Canadian dollar and the commodity price of natural gas. But you might notice that those will change quite a bit because again, the new Liberal government has promised a carbon tax. That won't apply to us because we are a carbon neutral process. So we might find that an introduction of that sort would really make us price competitive. Uh, similarly, the gas fire technology we were planning on using, main driver of all our costs. So we'll notice that as time goes on, that will get cheaper and more advanced. So, you know, it's not dead in the water, it just probably deserves being shelved for the moment. Uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. We are at 2470.